Hello, hello everyone. Let's see if anyone, are we, do we have any guests in the room yet? Looks like uh, it's just 12, 12.01. So we'll, we'll have some people join here in just a moment. Um, I realized I did not put up my welcome to Hummingbird Hour uh, screenshot. Let me see if I can find it because it's here. There's too many files on my computer. Let's just own that. Um, there's lots of files here. Um, welcome, welcome. Oh, we do have someone here. Yay. Welcome to Hummingbird Hour. We're going to start here in just a moment. Um, you know, we'll add, we're going to add the Hummingbird Hour welcome screen when we do the video editing. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So we have a couple of people with us. So I'm going to go ahead and officially begin. Welcome to Hummingbird Hour. Happy, happy Tuesday. I hope you are all doing well and staying safe. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Um, as a just a refresher, if for, the, for those of you who might be returning or for, for those of you who might be here with us for the first time, Hummingbird Hour is a weekly conversation series where we cover different topics about, about making the workplace a better place and the world a better place uh, and uh, a place and creating safe spaces for everyone so we can all be uh, included and seen and respected and valued for the unique and beautiful humans that we are. I am delighted today that we have two wonderful, amazing guests, uh, two, uh, two colleagues, uh, two DEI colleagues, uh, uh, who I have learned from and had the opportunity to partner with and work with uh, over, over the course of really over the last year. Um, the pandemic has really brought us together as colleagues. And, uh, and I know that uh, we all share a passion and a gratitude for the work that we get to do uh, to change hearts and minds um, and uh, and make make the world a better place. Uh, so I'm um, hopefully uh, well. I know I'm e I'm super excited about today's conversation, and I hope you are as well. Uh, we're going to hear from um, from from Lori Musinski and from Dr. Nika White. So today I'm going to be in the background. I'm going to pass the baton. Uh, they, they're more than capable than than they don't need me. So we're gonna we're gonna pass it over to to the two of them, uh, and I'll be with you for the rest of the session here and offering um, thoughts and chats and uh, sharing links and and uh, making sure that we can we um, connect all the dots uh, during the course of the session and some of the the chat in, in our chat room. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Lori, and I'm going to disappear. So take it away. Have a great conversation. Thanks for being here. All right. Thank you, Brian. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, as Brian said, I'm Lori Musinski. I am a principal consultant with Hummingbird Humanity, as well as, you know, just an world at large inclusion strategist. And my work is really rooted in a background in like business operations. And so I think about DEI from a process perspective and how do we integrate um, equity and inclusion into the way businesses operate. Um, and, you know, across across the board is kind of my specialty. And, um, and with me is Dr. Nika White. And Nika, I would love for you to just share a quick introduction that you would love everybody to know about you. I will be happy to, Lori. So thank you so much, first and foremost, for allowing me to share this space with you. And Brian, I know that you're behind the scenes listening now. And so I, I'm so grateful that you thought of me for this opportunity. Um, and so I'm Dr. Nico White. I serve as the founder and lead principal consultant for NWC. Um, it's a management consulting firm under my brand name, and we intersect the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion with leadership in business, working with all types of clients all over the globe, different industries, different sizes, different sectors, helping them to integrate into their business framework, strategic diversity, intentional inclusion, and a lens of equity. And I have to say that I am so honored to be here today. Lori and Brian are both great partners to NWC. We collaborate a good bit, and I'm just glad that today has presented another opportunity for us to do so. <laughs> Thank you. I know it's great. It's like uh, it's like a little band. We've got I know a exactly. <laughs> I often say that this community is quite small and it really is. I mean, it's gaining so much additional popularity in terms of people breaking into the space, but I love that it's all so small and quaint and that many of us as practitioners really um, find it appropriate to, to, to partner and to get to know each other so well. So I love it. 
Well, and I think part of that has been we've we've been fortunate that COVID has sort of forced us to build community over distances that we might not have previously built. And I think we'll probably end up talking about that since this is about how it has changed over the past year. Um, And that's certainly one thing that really comes to mind for me. Um, But yeah, to ground us in the conversation here today, we're really just going to be talking about what the two of us have seen over the past year. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have time to talk a little bit about what our hopes and dreams are for the future and what we'll see in the coming year. Um, hopefully, co- uh, hopefully coming COVID free year. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I didn't I know, <laughs> you know, I mean, it'll be in the US for sure. But yeah, you know, we're we're part of a global community. Absolutely. So who knows? Um, for those of you who are joining us, please do feel free to pop your questions into the chat. Um, you know, Brian is manning the chat. He'll make sure to bring questions up for us, or if we see them, we'll we'll bring them into the conversation. But um, please be participatory. We'd love to hear um, what you think and um, you know what what other questions you might have. So with that. Um, I'll get us started with our first prompt to consider. Um, So next week is the anniversary of George Floyd's murder. We have seen anti-Asian hate crimes increase with really no sign of slowing. Um, And we've had, we've been in a global pandemic for over a year now and are just starting to come out of it. And that global pandemic has really made, I think a lot of things clear to us that we've not been clear on before, either personally about our boundaries and what we can take and what we can't take and our priorities, but also it's really just laid bare um, the systemic inequities in our global societies and our local societies. And, And so I wanted to talk a little bit here about how have these social urgent issues or urgent social issues impacted DEI work in the workplace? Um, Nika, what have you seen around this? Yeah, well, well, first and foremost, thank you for bringing to the conversation this um, important time for so many of us are finding ways to reflect and to process, you know, grief still, um, and so many other um, feelings that are coming up as we navigate um, the anniversary of George Floyd's murder. Um, you know, I, I, Lori, I've said to a lot of audiences that what happened last summer, um, May 25th, to be exact, it was it was a reckoning in many regards in that not that it was new for so many of us, because I think that so many of us could point to other situations that were just as horrific um, that occurred. And but I think that it was so pronounced and that it was visual. It was it was a, it was an opportunity where so many people were witness to it and it was hard. And because of that, it created this groundswell of of people being having a deepened appetite for entering into the conversation, right? What am I missing? What have I not paid attention to now that seems to be um, so real now that I've seen it and been witness to it and it's undeniable. And I think that that in and of itself created an opportunity for so many individuals um, and organizations to then enter into this broad conversation of equity and um, racial injustice. And um, it's caused organizations and organizational leaders to think more intently about um, a position that they should be taking as, as organizations and brands that really care about humanity. What does that look like to speak it in a way and to live it in a way where people can find us um, as credible and really our, our message of really being about people and community. And, and I think that that has created this um, additional influx, if you will, of, of interest in, in finding a way to deepen organizations' commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, even the language has shifted. I I recall that so often many organizations would refer to their corporate social responsibility efforts just as that corporate social responsibility. Um, But now we're hearing and seeing a lot of organizations be very distinct with, with their language and they're saying social corporate justice. So the bottom line is that people are realizing that what's happening outside of the four walls of their organization um, is definitely impacting the way in which their people, their associates, their teammates and colleagues are showing up to the organization. And to deny that and not be called to action in some way to help provide that level of support and acknowledgement and, and solidarity 
is, is hurting organizations. And so that's primarily what I have seen. And um, while bittersweet, it's, it's welcomed. It's welcomed because um, while it's, it's uh, unfortunate that it took something that hard, that visual, for, for some individuals to then enter into the conversation, they're here now. So what are we gonna do about that? And how are we going to make sure that George Floyd's murder is not in vain? And I yeah. think that's the mindset that people are showing up to this conversation with. Yeah, I, I think that um, adding to all of that, one of the other things that's become really obvious is that there, the separation between work and personal lives is not what it used to be. And it really never was what it used to be. We just sort of denied that it was there. You know, it was, yeah. it was that, you know, there's work and there's personal and never the two shall meet. And they always were meeting. It's just, we were better at compartmentalizing because we sort of had to, and it was the social norm and yeah. whether companies and leaders want to accept it or not, they're, they're sort of being forced to move forward with it anyway, because to your point, companies that don't embrace this are going to have problems. Um, I think it's become clear how the events that happen outside of our workplaces affect the humans that are inside of your workplace. Right. And that right. we, we just can no longer expect people to show up like nothing's going on whether it is a very public atrocity like right. the murder of George Floyd or whether it's something more personal like a sick parent or child or right. even yourself you know yeah. we we've hidden those things and and i think we're starting to see and struggle with yeah. how, do we, how do we work yeah. that out in the workplace yeah, I so I so appreciate that commentary, Lori. You know, a cry was made not only for justice and the memory of George Floyd and his family, but also for a racial reckoning across community and across industry. Something else that I have noticed um, by way of change as a result of May 25th in myself personally has to do with the way in which I even show up to this work. You know, um, there's been this deepened commitment to my team and to myself to make sure that I, I'm taking time to heal as well from something that deeply impacted me as well. You know, I am the wife of a black man. I am the mother of a black boy. And, um, you know, I found that while I was holding space for so many other people trying to, to be strong, I was unintentionally kind of putting my own feelings aside. I didn't allow my own self to really grieve in a way that was, I felt was unhealthy. And so, as a practitioner, what I realize is that, you know, as they always say, put your oxygen mask on first before you try to help someone else. And in being intentional about that, I think that it certainly has um, matured my approach um, to this discipline and this space. And um, and I've, I've been intentional about also encouraging the same for those that are part of my team and other practitioners that I care about in this space. That's such a wonderful personal advancement in it. Yeah. It, it asks me to reflect on, you know, maybe some of my personal changes and as a practitioner. And honestly, I think the biggest one is that I'm less afraid now. I, mm. I think practitioners have been, there's that saying that if you're not willing to lose your job, you're not doing DEI right. Right. <laughs> terrible. We shouldn't have to be willing to lose our jobs in order to be successful. I know. But, I know. And I, but I do think this moment for, for some people has allowed them to, and for me, be a little bit more forceful and sure of what I know yes. to be the right answers or the better answers or the path, <laughs> the, the, the somewhat step forward answers in the right direction without so much fear of making it fit into the, you know, the, the leadership team, making the um, business case every single conversation, right, right. Um, being able to just stand up and say, this is what you need to do. And it's just, it's what yeah. you need to do. You know, and I think that's the beauty of also being um, a consultant in this space. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have such a high level of appreciation for those who do this work inside of organizations, because I know that's a whole level of complexity that comes with that. Um, but one of the reasons that I think I felt so empowered since, since launching my business and doing this work as a consultant is that 
I am a little more emboldened to be able to stand true with my convictions, deep convictions around this work. And if it doesn't feel right and it doesn't align, then I'm okay with being able to walk away, you know? And, um, and that's liberating. It's liberating because at the end of the day, while this certainly is an opportunity from a business perspective to, you know, be a capitalist and, and to make money, and there's nothing at all wrong with that. We all, we're all are entrepreneurs. At the same time, I want to make sure that I'm doing it in a way to where the work is impactful. And it's, it's with the convictions that I have of this work. Um, and so that's empowering for me. So I'm, I'm curious, Lori, how, have you thought about um, the 25th, May 25th, which is just next week? Have you given any thought to what do you plan to do on that day to just commemorate the anniversary of, of Floyd's death and to consider what feels right? Have, have you given that any thought? Yeah, and, and actually, Brian and I, um, we have a, a group of people that we meet with on a weekly basis where we talk about... Um, social justice issues that are primarily focused around race. And um, next week we're uh, taking the week to discuss what has happened over the course of the year, reflect upon our feelings, reflect upon mm -hmm. just honoring George Floyd and all right. the others who have come before and after and um, hold space for, for each other to process that information and, you know, right. those feelings, um, because it's a lot. And, um, and I think, you know, I know that, that you sent out a note that, you know, you're going to take, I think, you know, the last hour of the day mm -hmm. or an hour of the day at, mm -hmm. um, Nika White Consulting to allow people to do whatever they need to do with that time. And yeah. I think that that's really wonderful. I haven't seen other people do that. And it would be such a wonderful thing for companies to do. Yeah, um, you know, we were we were very thoughtful about what is a meaningful way for us to honor George Floyd's legacy and um, and what his murder has meant for, again, this racial reckoning that's occurring. And, and so we, we will be taking on the anniversary of Floyd's death, we will be taking the last hour of our workday to honor George Floyd. And, and as we think about that, we want to honor him um, as a father, as a friend that he was to so many people, as an artist. And collectively, we want to share memories of his life that we have been, um, that we have encountered from his loved ones through what we've read or what we may have, you know, encountered and, and then reflect upon the way his murder impacted each member of our team uniquely and markedly. And so hopefully through those conversations, we will find some sense of, of peace about the hard work that we do every single day, knowing that um, the fight is, is, is not over, the work has to continue, but um, that, that, feels, that feels right to us. And so I think that it's important for organizations all over to be thoughtful about you know, what seems appropriate to, you know, to reflect on George Floyd's legacy. And I'm sure it's going to look, look different across so many different organizations, but um, I do hope that our organizations are at least considering what they can do and align it with their culture, their environment, what feels right for them. I think that we owe that. Um, we are in essence indebted to the legacy of George Floyd and the price of his life was never meant to be paid. Um, and so what can we do to honor his life during this anniversary of his, of his murder? Yeah. <sighs> I know. So yeah. Well, I think sometimes I pausing is the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. And I, and I think it really, it comes back to how do we make space for people inside of a workplace for mm -hmm. things that have been seen as personal issues in the past. Right. And I've seen some companies do, um, you know, like safe spaces where they'll just say, hey, here's an hour, come if you want, don't come if you don't want, do what you need to do, be in community, not be in community. I've seen some companies do where they're actually bring in a psychologist mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to facilitate those kind of 
right. conversations. Um, what have you seen with the companies that you're working with or what do you recommend for how to provide some of that personal support that's maybe a little bit beyond just, you know, call the ERP or, you know, or call, yeah, call, have, contact you know, your EAP and have it and schedule a session. EAP, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I don't want to pretend that I am clearly aligned around there being a right or a wrong way. I think that each organization, its culture and, and how in which it has navigated these, you know, these complex topics, I think that plays a role because you don't want it to feel as though we're, we're, we're doing it just for the sake of doing it because people expect us to do something. So that's first and foremost. But like you, I've seen similar things. Some organizations are doing half day. Some are allowing people to just take take, um, you know, a day off, no questions asked. If you want to separate, take a day off. Um, I have seen where organizations have organized these, um, in these assemblies where people are in their own way, maybe sharing a poem or maybe sharing reflections. Um, I mean, so different things that, and what I, what I think has been really impactful that I've heard so far is organizations who are trying to align their work in their industry um, with with how to commemorate this moment, right? And, and the legacy of, of George Floyd. And so for example, we have um, a publishing company that we work with and they're bringing in um, some of their authors who write books about you know, the, the racial systemic issues and things of that nature um, to come and do like live reading of certain portions, just to again, center us around his, his, his death um, cannot be in vain. His murder cannot be in vain. So how do we continue to keep this information in front of us? You know, it's, it's hard, Lori, because people process differently. And for some, it's incredibly triggering to a point to where, um, you know, they, they need space to deal with it, maybe in a quiet way with, with their loved ones and not having to have the burden of, of the pressures that come with the workplace. And so, again, I don't think there's really a right or wrong way. I think that it's, it just requires organizations being very thoughtful to provide a couple different options for people to decide how in which they want to engage. Yeah, I, I'm seeing Janice made a comment that I think is kind of related about, you know, grappling with the emotional toll that the past year has taken. And, and if we think about, you know, COVID also as, you know, yeah. an issue of, you know, what we've all had psychological impacts up until now. And I think there's a lot of people that kind of feel like, oh, well, we'll get back to the office and everything will be great. And I don't think people are really reckoning yet with, you um, how long some of these issues are going to be with us. Um, right. You know, I myself am like, oh yeah, I want to go back in the office, kind of, like yeah. maybe a couple days a week, but you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like when, you know, and I see this with friends that, you know, hey, let's, you know, maybe it's safe to get together for a drink and people are kind of like, maybe not, not ready. Yeah, and it's just the yeah. tip of the iceberg of like, once right. we have to move back into the workplace. Um, and I wonder what learnings we can take from this past year of COVID that, that would help us as we continue to, to move forward and what should we not lose and maybe what do we need to evolve? I, I love that, Lori. One thing that comes to mind for me is I have appreciated the, the convenience of um, the digital world. And as you mentioned at the start, the connectivity to people that you may not have, you know, with directly within your network. But one of the things that I've also have appreciated about this, this year of, of slowing down is just that the pacing has, uh, has, has been modified. And I think there's something to be said for us easing into situations, you know, I think that normally speaking, um, we are just fast paced world, right? We move very fast. And I think sometimes we move without that level of intentional thoughtfulness that, um, you know, requires us to to really consider what am I coming at this from a place of empathy and compassion? Um, and, and I hope that that doesn't change. I mean, I realize that once things are returning back to um, what we at one time called the norm, that we also take with us the ability to pause and reflect where we need to. Cause I think that's just so important. 
um, even like going back into the workforce. I mean, I, I'm hearing a lot of organizations are having these transition plans where it's not just, okay, on XYZ date, we're all going to return back full force, you know, nine to five. They're talking about what departments should we bring back for a period of time? And, and maybe it's half days, maybe we work our way up. And, and I, I think there's some merit to that, that approach. I really hope it opens up more fully the not just the the acceptance of remote work, which yeah. you know, I, I, I mean, I remember when I first started working, it was like, well, you have, you know, one of the benefits of the company I, I was at was you get one day a month where you can work remotely without rationale. Like you can just take it. I was like, oh, yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> one day a month that I can work remotely without having to tell somebody why. I know, it's, it's a glorious. gift. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I actually, I actually like that. I like that. You know, so my organization has been remote since day one. So even when I tell people that we are remote, I feel like I have to clarify, not because of the pandemic, but because it's just our business model. And this worked really well for us, but it also has caused us to be incredibly intentional about those high connection touch points to make sure that the team is well supported, that there's a sense of community, especially again, when I consider the space that we're in and the work that we do, a lot of heavy lifting there. And so um, I don't know. I'll, I'll be curious to see how other organizations are incorporating the remote work scenario into um, their practices. You know, it's a lot of benefits, but, you know, certainly there's also some potential cons that organizations have to be thoughtful about. There are definitely cultural drawbacks and, yeah. and inclusionary drawbacks. You know, it used right. to be, the norm used to be you had a meeting in the office and you would remote somebody in on the, you know, not working conference phone and you could never hear them and there was always noise. And then that person like never had a say, never, you know, never got to yes. speak up or at the very end of the meeting, you'd be like, I, Jane, did you have anything to say <laughs> after this hour long meeting where you I know. Sitting? you know, hold basically. And so, you know, how are we more intentional about being inclusive when we've got a workforce that is probably not ever again going to be located in all one location? Right, right. I, I, I'm totally with you on that. I know that as a result of the pandemic, there are a number of organizations that completely changed their model and they did away with the brick and mortar. Um, and I'm wondering if any of them are now maybe regretting that now that we're getting closer to, you know, opening back up completely. I, I would be curious to hear, you know, if once some time of settling into that, what the regrets are, if any, and maybe there's not, I don't know. Interesting yeah. study though, for someone to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, kind of related, um, we have another question about like how ritual might help us in this particular mm, area. Uh, yeah. so, many, so many company rituals are based in, you know, office happy hours or going yeah. out doing a softball league. And yeah. um, have you seen anything, any rituals that people have created that your companies have created that you worked with that are interesting? You know what I've seen a lot of, and it makes perfect sense, book clubs you know, internal book clubs. And, and I think that's great because not only is it a way to create a sense of community, but it's also part of the learning and development experience. You know, um, as people are processing together and they're sharing their thoughts and their reflections, there's so much value to that. Um, and then if you align that with content that helps us to, you know, emphasize the importance of humanity, <laughs> then, you know, it's a win-win situation. That's what I've seen a lot of. Um, you know, I have seen, you know, the happy hours and things of that nature, but, you know, that gets a little problematic too, you know, because, you know, you have to think about there's some people who, when you say happy hour, we have to take into account that that can be very exclusionary for those who, again, are, are practicing sobriety and it's not something that, you know, maybe it's for other reasons that they don't drink. And so you've seen people introduce coffee tea hour. So, but I, I'll tell you what I've appreciated is the level of, of creativity and intentionality that some organizations are leaning into to make sure they're being thoughtful about the, those nuances that perhaps at one point in time just didn't occur to them, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I've, en I've enjoyed that. Yeah. I've seen companies also put into effect some like no meetings Fridays and, yes. you know, and, and it, that's not necessarily connection ritual, <laughs> but it is a ritual that allows people the space to do what they need to do with their day without, you know, feeling that, yeah. that pressure. And so I've, I've seen, I've seen that kind of stuff around yeah. norms. I've seen some norming around working hours. I've seen, right. um, you know, just some, some like digital cultural yeah. norms and expectations that 
um, you know, help do some of the lift of that, that like yeah. work. You're right. So I have, I do have a client that they've implemented kind of no meeting Fridays, which I thought was great. And then I, another organization I remember reading, they have, um, because Zoom fatigue is real, you know, they have those days to where no Zoom meetings. If we have meetings, it needs to be another, you know, meta modality, but no Zoom meetings. Um, and so, yeah, it's interesting how people are finding, you know, different ways to, to address um, some of the you know, the complexity of, of being remote. Um, I love the fact that Brian, as we were talking about happy hour, he placed into the chat happiness hour. I absolutely love that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, everyone has, to, you have to, I, I'm trying to think what that looks like though. Happiness hour, everyone shows up just very cheerful, spreading the love, spreading the joy, sharing happy moments. I mean, that can be really instrumental too, because again, think about how often we find ourselves, you know, the energy that maybe we pick up from, from others, it certainly can land on us. And then we're kind of setting that tone for others that we encounter. And so, yeah, I love that idea of just the happiness hour. That's yeah, gratitude. Yeah, gratitude, gratitude yeah. hour, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but this is so important because while it seems so simple, imagine how compelling it is to helping people with their mental state, you know, it's Mental Health Awareness Month. And so sometimes simple things can really shift our, our mind space to a place that allows us to be much more healthy. And I just, I, so I love those ideas. Yeah, it's great. Well, I know we focus a lot just by virtue of who the, you know, the two of us and Brian are, we're positive <laughs> people. So we focus a lot on like, what's been great. Ha has there been anything that have, has happened in 2020 um, in the workplace around some of these ideas we're brainstorming um, that should like stay behind that we're just, you know, hashtag fail and, you know. Oh my gosh, where do I start? It's probably equal number of good things as there are bad things. Right. Um, you know, I, I, one thing that comes to mind immediately for me is, and I'm not, I'm not saying that all organizations who have tried to do this on their own have failed at it, but, you know, this idea of the safe space conversations, right, were the two things that come to mind for me, one of which is what makes a safe space is not just someone saying this is a safe space, it is really being able to bring to that conversation um, an opportunity for people to name what's going to make it safe for you and then for everybody to be aligned around that. So that's one thing. So the second thing is there's a lot of well-intended organizations that have um, incorporated these safe space conversations. Again, great value in them. But if it's not expert led, I've seen them go awry to where my company has had to go in and kind of course correct on some of that. And so, you know, when, if you could just consider when you're getting people assembled to share their thoughts and how in which they're processing and navigating the complexity of all of these traumatic issues, um, you're asking people to lean into their vulnerabilities, to be present with their emotions and to be uninhibited in sharing what they're thinking and feeling. So you have to be prepared for all types of fallout. And so I think that I would love to see organizations to think more intently about make that investment. If you really want this to be useful and not harmful, make that investment and getting someone who is trained at being able to hold space for people in that type of way um, to facilitate that. So that's one thing that I've seen gone bad that I wish would, you know, not continue. Um, you know, we talk often about examples of organizations that come across very performative, you know, as they are making statements and they are trying to align with um, what feels like is the right thing to do in the moment. I want to see um, the performative nature of how brands are showing up to this work to stay behind. That, that definitely is creating more harm than not. Um, I love the fact that um, organizations are thinking more intently about strategies. And I know I'm getting now to a plus, but strategies for, for how to do this work of dismantling systemic racism in a more thoughtful manner. I mean, what I've seen, and you probably have seen this too, Lori, is that if, as people are calling and asking to explore a partnership and services, it's not just, okay, well, we need an unconscious bias training. They are really using language now that leads me to believe they have concluded that this is not a kind of a one and done. We are talking about impact and not activity. There's a keen difference. Activity has a start and an end date. Impact, you're looking at systems, policies, procedures, culture, and that tends to lead towards sustainable outcomes. And so so I have I've appreciated um, 
the influx of, of what I have perceived as people really getting it, you know, and not just asking for some type of surface approach. I really want you to peel back all the layers and help us identify the root causes of issues that's compromising inclusion. And so, um, yeah, it's like the iceberg model <laughs> that uh, Brian is sharing. We have to get to the root of it and let's address it there. So I don't know. So I guess I gave you two, two bad. I want to leave behind and one good to align with all the other good that I mentioned before. <laughs> yes, yes. And it, you know, some of the things that you mentioned lead me to, you know, one of the things that I think a lot about that I guess is a little bit something to leave behind, although it's, it's something that it's a behavior that just needs to break yeah. moving forward is that the feeling that there's any quick fixes in this general vicinity oh, yeah. is just... Yeah. You know, even, even when companies are using the right language and even when they're asking for, you know, deep strategy, I, I still think that leaders are expecting for their employees to trust them that they are doing the right thing. And they are not starting at a place of trust in this regard. It's, no, it's not right. building trust. It's literally, you are you have to fill the hole of broken trust first. Right, exactly. Then you're maybe going to be on solid ground. And then yeah. you can start to build. You're so right, Lori. And I'm seeing an influx of, of healing and reconciliation work entering into this space for that very reason. You know, you can't say, trust me. I'm turning over a new leaf without building, you know, building up that trust, regaining that trust. Mm -hmm. And uh, and something else that comes to mind is what I want to leave behind would be the council culture. I am not a fan. I am not a fan. I know that there are practitioners that are of the persuasion that it's necessary to show up in this work with such deep convictions to where by any means necessary, you get your point across. And, but I just think that that hurts us. You know, we, we need everyone involved and engaged in order for us all to emerge stronger. And so rather than debating at, you know, someone entering the conversation late or coming to the party late, you're here now. So what can we do to help support that? And, um, so I'm not a fan. I want to leave the council culture behind. I really do. Now that's not giving anyone a pass. I think sometimes accountability can look like punishment for others. So we do need to educate around that. It's not punishment. It's really being true to the work and the outcomes that we want to see that our society deserves. But um, yeah, council culture, I think it needs to be left behind. It's so damaging. I mean, it's, it's, that's damaging in your personal life. It's damaging in your professional life. It's yeah. obviously part of white supremacy culture that, that yes. either, or mentality that you're either right or you're wrong. And yes. yeah. there, there are so few things in life. I know, I know. The sun will rise every day. <laughs> yeah. So we, you know, myself, you and Brian are all connected and really just adore Jennifer Brown and the platform that she has, but she talks often about holding the middle. And I love that because I think that part of the offense sometimes that gets people to a place to where they aren't willing to be agile and to lean in to the fact that maybe we don't know what we don't know, this other perspective out there, is that we classify information all the time as right, wrong, good or bad, instead of being able to just reconcile that there is this middle that, you know, that there can be two competing truths based upon the lens of the individual that's seated in that seat. You know, where you sit determines what you see and what you see is your lens and your lens is how we navigate through life. And so without being willing to hold the middle, I think that we compromise so much opportunity for collaboration and for, you know, greater level of, um, of, of conflict to be resolved. So anyway, yeah. I mean, that fear of conflict is part of it. And I think this is just a skill set that everybody's going to need to develop. And, and it's, it's just starting now that, that what you're talking about of like, how do we hold multiple truths at the mm -hmm. same time? How can we do anti-racism work and still do racist things? Yes. Oh, and exactly. how does that not yeah. You know, and, and why does there have to be, there doesn't have to be a scorecard of I'm doing more anti-racist things than racist things. And so mm -hmm. I'm good. And there's yeah. that, that, that also that tie in with like good and bad and those judgment calls yeah. and that, you know, with cancel culture, you do one bad thing and you're a terrible right. person. Exactly. You're exactly. Rede Non-redeemable. <laughs> and um, right. Right. Yeah. We all, we all are on a journey and um, the journey for each of us is going to look different. Again, not giving anyone a pass at all, but I do think there's something to be said for the recognition 
that we all are entering these conversations with different mental models, with, with different level of knowledge and perspective. And if we really want to be found emerging stronger as a society, we're going to have to be willing to extend grace and accept grace because we're going to make mistakes too, right? Yeah. And you talked about conflict just a moment ago. We have to realize that not all conflict is bad. You know, I think that sometimes we run away from conflict because we see it as this bad thing. There is great value in healthy conflict. You know, that's where we get some of the greatest benefits from diversity is through that healthy banter and, you know, greater problem solving ability, greater creativity, which leads to innovation. And so, um, yeah, we need to kind of change the narrative around conflict being bad. Yeah. And, um, you know what else? I heard someone say this just recently, and I thought this was so profound. I never thought about it this way. I think that sometimes as practitioners, maybe we don't realize we're doing this. And even just organizations who are in the space or the profession of, of HR, um, is we want to throw some type of DEI coaching and training at it as a solution. And it causes people to feel like I'm being punished by engaging in DEI training and coaching. And we don't want this to be positioned as a punishment, right? So anyway, I just... I don't know why that popped into my head, Lori, but it did. <laughs> well, it's so related. I was also thinking about earlier about the, you know, the inclusive leadership skill set, you know, and I think about it, I'm like, no, no, that's just leadership. Like, yes, exactly. That is why, why I'm an inclusive leader. It's like, that should just be leader. And that is a plus one, plus two, plus three, and just keep going to infinity. But yes, and part of the premise of the message that we at NWC really like to articulate every chance that we get is that being inclusion minded is a leadership competency, but not by title or position, but just by influence. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what our position and title is. We all can be able to demonstrate and foster inclusivity in spaces in which we, we dwell and belong simply because of our influence. So we need to stop seeing it, seeing the work of DEI as the responsibility of those who hold the title of chief diversity officer, manager, practitioner, or even the HR professionals. It's part of a responsibility that we all should take some sense of ownership around. And I so want to see that amplified. I think that is a ticket to getting us much further ahead than where we are. Because too many people who at their core, if you were to engage them, it's clear that they have some level of appreciation and, and, and can value diversity, equity, and inclusion, but they're passive and that they're kind of like, well, I yeah, I believe in it. It is important. Now go and do it. Right. I know? wrote the check. What do you want? Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> go, just go and do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm all bored. Go and do it instead of like owning it. And when we own it, that gives us a greater sense of accountability, which means that I think that translates into us modeling it in a very actionable way that can be contagious. So that's what I want. Yeah. 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 I also think about, I think about leaders and what when we talk about like diversity as a positive thing and not a punishment, which of yeah. course we all believe in, but, but when you think about how much that opens up the possibilities of defining a successful leader, you know, you mm -hmm. up until now it's been, well, a successful leader has traits that are traditionally masculine and um, white. <laughs> and so, you know, when you think about these competencies that um, are so important and always have been important, but just not celebrated um, or desired, it opens up the reframing of, well, this marginalized person, it doesn't have what it takes to be a good leader because we're reframing what it means to be a good leader. And then the folks who've been marginalized for whatever identity they've been marginalized for, um, you know, having been marginalized trains us to be, to step exactly. into those qualities that, yeah. um, you know, it shouldn't have to do with gender. It shouldn't have yeah. to do with race. And, it, and it's, it's about the socialization. We do it, you know, women can multitask because we're expected to, not because we're like physically better at multitasking. Right. <laughs> Cause we've been right. told we have to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would love to reframe what a successful leader looks like so that I can just stop hearing the, you know, I don't want to lower my expectations for these leadership positions in order to bring in a woman or a person of color, because 
well, what are your expect? Have you have you interrogated your expectations? Yes, exactly. And so, so one of those things that really hits um, hits a nerve with me every time I see it or I hear it is when someone is referring to again deepening the pool of candidates to include those individuals that are part of these marginalized, underrepresented, or underestimated communities, and they always put the word qualified in for in front of it. It's almost like yes, we need a qualified diverse candidate or a qualified person of color. I mean. When do we ever go and recruit for unqualified people, right? <laughs> I mean, really, when do we ever go and just set out to, yes, I want to find unqualified people to put into my candidate pool? No, no, no. And so what you share really resonates with me because I do think reimagining this whole leadership is important because let's think about it. Right now, the way in which majority of society thinks about leadership is based upon a definition that is really steeped in white supremacy. And so, you know, yes, let's, you know, reframing, reimagining is, is, is a beautiful thing. And I think there's a lot of topics that we need to be reimagining and reframing yes. under this broad umbrella of DEI. You know, even the, I say often that we have to shift the paradigm because right now when we talk about DEI, sometimes it's from the obligation perspective, but let's shift the paradigm and talk about it as an opportunity perspective. I think that language and framing and positioning is so important to our ability to really um, gain the momentum that's needed around certain populations who are just finding themselves stuck and don't know how to, to think about, you know, DEI in general. So I, yeah. I think that part of the problem in the past that I'd love to leave behind is that DEI is seen as deeply entrenched with HR and HR is seen as compliance. And, and so you do have this very negative connotation that, you know, it's an association that, that I mean, it's not fair to HR practitioners either. Right? You know, it's not fair to anybody. Right. There, there are parts of HR that are about compliance. Absolutely. Just as there are parts yeah. of people that are about compliance. Um, you know, those are, there are pieces of DEI that are about compliance. We have laws yeah. that we right. need to make sure we're, we're taking into account, but that's not the bulk of the work. No, it's not the bulk of the work. And while it may be an entry point for some organizations, they definitely should not pitch their tent there. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk about three C's of, of motivators and drivers for, for DEI. And the first is compliance. And usually when we talk about from compliance standpoint, to, to the point that you're bringing up, Lori, it's those organizations that are doing the bare minimum to remain compliant. They want to remain out of someone's courtroom, right? They don't want any lawsuits placed against them. Yeah. They want to make sure that they're staying within the, you know, adhering to all of the, um, the, the regulations based upon their industry or, or sector. Uh, and then the second C is character. And that's when people are driven or motivated to do the work of DEI because they have reckoned that it is the right thing to do. So I wanna make sure that I'm following this moral compass and that I am um, really deeply connected to the humanity aspect of it. And I'm concerned about you know, the reputation as a brand or as a staple organization. And then the third C is commerce. And that's when it really aligns with kind of the business case reasons. What I tend to tell organizations is, I think that we need a blend of the moral imperative along with the business imperative. Mm -hmm. That's what I find to really stick, if you will, when talking with those influencers and organizations that can help impact policies, procedures, culture, right? Um, people are, you know, the way in which they respond and engage and embrace this work can look different. And so we have to align strategy behind this work too. Um, I really do believe that it's not, you know, I was at one point early in my career, I was all about, you know, let's just all go to Disney World and just be happy all the time, right? It's the right thing to do. Why can't you just really gravitate to that? It's the right thing to do, that's it. And I would leave it there. And I was repeatedly, repeatedly met with people who would look at me like, uh, this doesn't resonate, you know? <laughs> okay, this does, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not, no. But when we can strategically say, these are the benefits to your bottom line, you're now gonna become an employer destination because you're able to attract and retain the best talent. You're gonna have greater um, innovation around your product and service offerings because of being intentional with creating these team structures where people can really be thought partners and different perspectives and great healthy conflict and banter. I mean, all of those reasons. And so, Yes, we have to approach this work in a very strategic way. Anyway. Yeah. Well, I want to make sure that we allow some time here at the end to talk about hope and the future yes. and yeah. what, is, what is making you hopeful 
for the future of um, DEI in the workplace and I, I think society in general? So there are a couple of things that come to mind. First, I will say that without hope, and Brian Stevenson has given us this, without hope, then um, you know we're not going to be able to continue um, to even try to fight the good fight, if you will, right? Because we will feel defeated even before we take the first step. So we have to believe, first and foremost, that our society deserves to be inclusive, deserves to be equitable, and allow full opportunity of success for all people. And again, get back to that humanity, the core of this work. And if we believe that, then I think that it keeps us at a posture of hope, hope in that we can help create it. And not feeling as though we have to do this alone. Not one person, not one organization, not one institution is going to be able to do it. It's going to be a combination of all of those entities coming together to little at a time do what they can within their sphere of influence for us all to be able to emerge stronger. So I think it's about recognizing what we can each do within our individual influence and then how can we take that and align it with other causes and organizations and contribute in that regard. Um, but also what makes me hopeful, Lori, is that while I can name probably a dozen or so situations every week that has caused me to walk away feeling a little defeated and a little deflated, uh, I also can walk away with a dozen of, of examples that make me proud of, of how people are um, engaging in this work and the outcomes that they are seeing and the benefit that people are getting, particularly those that are part of marginalized communities. And so I think we have to celebrate the small wins and let that fuel us and to take us to the next victory and then let that take us to the next victory. Um, but let's not, let's not demise, you know, some of these, the progress that's being made. It's all about progress and not perfection. Um, and I think if we have that mindset, it keeps us at a place of, of being hopeful and that's important. Yeah. How about you? I think How are you, what are you seeing in terms of that's generating some hope for you about the future? I think for me, I'm seeing so many people entering the space. And while there are potential issues with having an influx of people who don't know how to be practitioners into the space. A whole nother conversation for a whole nother day. I'm with you. <laughs> that's a, a watch out. But I'm with like, you. I kind of see it as like the firefighters running into the fire, right? Like things no. are on yeah. fire. This is yeah. not easy work. It did mm -hmm. not just get easier. It just got harder. Right. Um, just because there's more people doing it and companies are putting more money against it, we still aren't seeing the proper support for right. you know, hire a leader. Um, it's probably you've hired a leader of color and then you're gonna be like, cool, I checked the box and you have no money and no team and good luck. And you'll quit in nine months and we'll hire somebody else. And we'll always have a face on our website that you know makes, makes us look better. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff that's like not great, but mm -hmm. I see so many people are like, asking me, how do how did you break into DEI? And how did you make the transition? Or I just got out of college and I want to move into this as my career. Yeah. And it's so like, there's just so many people who are willing to run into the fire. Right. And yeah. I am so encouraged. Oh because it felt so hard before not having a lot of those, those folks. And, um, and then I think out of that, I hope to see DEI emerge as a function separate from HR um, that is more robust. You know, we've yeah. all, practitioners have been jacks of all, jacks and Janes of all <laughs> directions. Um, we've had to be trainers, facilitators, strategists, right. budget managers, program managers, leadership, you know, yeah. um, relationship yeah. managers we've had to talk you know like we've had to be problem solvers and and it's it's way too much to expect you know when i when i see the job strip description of like must be able to speak at conferences and get through to senior leadership and program manage the you know, you know yeah. everyday programs i'm like that's not the same person and so exactly i'm really excited that we have so many senior level people who've been doing this work for years and now a whole bunch of like youthful entrants who are going to bring new perspectives right what we've been doing hasn't been perfect so 
I'm really looking forward to all of the influx of new ideas, new perspectives, crossover from different um, experiences. Uh, now that companies are hiring, now that people are trying to expand their search to find a better, a, you know, a diverse candidate slate, they're opening up to different industry experience. So yeah. we're going to start to have cross pollination and that all just leads me to be hopeful that DEI will become a reputable function that has people at all levels, that people can specialize in what they want to specialize yes. in and be awesome at it and mentor others. And it just feels like it's going to open up so many career pathways. And that's maybe a selfish hope of like for us and the people, you know, those of us in our community, I, I want us to be more fulfilled and supported and not feel like we're putting our everything and getting right. like midgets back. I would no. be so hopeful for that. No, I, I love that, Lori. And 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 you're right. That gives me hope as well. I love to see the additional um, credibility that's being added to this space and this discipline. And like you, um, yes, I have encountered so many people over the past 12 to 24 months who are, are very intentional about trying to navigate towards this career path. And um, that, that's exciting. It really is. Um, I, do, I do wish that we can find a way to help protect the integrity of, of the discipline and the industry. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. I know that there are several different, um, you know, credentialing type of agencies that that certainly can help provide some parameters around, um, you know, that process. But I just saw where so many people overnight uh, became subject matter experts. <laughs> and so that was a bit concerning for me as well, you know. Yeah. Um, but again, I think that the beauty of it is that there's now this heightened level of awareness of um of you know the credibility of this space and the expertise, the strategic nature of this space that is so exciting, so exciting for me. Um, so yeah, this has yeah. been such a great conversation. Oh, I do worry about the harm bit too. You know, you've got look, we're all we're all human beings, and no matter how practiced we are, and I, we still do unintentional harm because we're working in an emotional space. There's no of way course, to avoid it, every single day, every, every single day. day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was part of a session the other day that my team was actually leading for a group of, of community leaders and the facilitator, one of the questions he asked was how, how would you rate yourself in terms of cultural competence? And it was maybe like, I'm very culturally competent, mildly, you know, hardly culturally competent. And when I just thought about the enormity of that question and the enormity of the world. Here I am as someone that's been in the space for years. I put mildly culturally competent, you know, because I'm thinking about the complexity of all. I mean, you know, which culture? I know, right? <laughs> How, let, let's define this a little bit better. I mean, what are we talking about exactly? I mean, so anyway, I I think that we're we're always learning, and we should always be in this posture of learning. And um, it's it's a large world, but so yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been just an awesome conversation as it, it always has. is when you and I get together. And um, I want to make sure that I allow, if Brian wants to come back on and, and give a message here at the end, allow Absolutely. a little bit of time for that. So thank you, Nika. Brian, thank you for the thank space. You. Um, mm -hmm. We thank just you, Brian. love your partnership and, um, you know, I appreciate you both so much always. Oh, thank you. It's great to share space with you, Lori. And again, I also want to extend um, my appreciation and gratitude to Brian for the opportunity. <laughs> Of course, of course. Well, thank you both for being here. And I know, Nika, you gave uh, Jennifer Brown a nod earlier. In the <laughs> and, and I know all of us would say we've learned so much from Jennifer and the spirit of inviting two beautiful women, voices, powerful voices, people who have a have a have have something to share and something we can all learn from to the stage is was inspired by, by Jennifer, who has given her stage to others mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I really wanted to take that nod from her and say, Absolutely. I want to give the stage that I get to have 
uh, to, to these two individuals. And we have more conversations like this one uh, coming up. So Lori and Nika, thank you for sharing your time and your wisdom wisdom and your passion with us. Uh, I really I really appreciated today's conversation. And I, I um, and while there's so many things I'd love to comment on, I'm, I'll just comment on the spirit of what, what I, I really, um, I, I really heard a lot of was there is hope uh, and there's hope for, for all of us and for the world and for all the communities that all three of us are committed to serving um, and to making a difference in. And, uh, and let's hope we can leave some of those things behind that aren't serving us well and we yes. can put some new things with us into the future. Um, cancel culture, be gone. Um, inclusive <laughs> leadership become a trait for everyone. We need all of us in the game. So um, thank you both. And uh, on Monday, uh, we will be having a follow-up conversation uh, really to this, I think, so to really the spirit of this conversation led by Bryce Salato, uh, Andre Herring, um, and J.D. Valladares-Williams, uh, who will be talking about allyship against hate. Uh, and uh, that is on Monday rather than Tuesday. We, we felt like um, Hummingbird Hour should not be on the anniversary of George Floyd's death. So uh, conversations can really focus and time can be focused in honor of his legacy. Uh, but the conversation will center around how we can all continue to, to, to be active allies um, and, and make the world better for everyone. So thank you both. Thank you everyone for watching and for being with us. Uh, happy, happy Tuesday, stay safe and be well. Bye everyone. Bye.